Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm very excited today to be talking with Dr. Scott Morris, family physician who's founder and CEO of Church Health, which was begun in 1987. As I mentioned, he's a family physician, and he's also a United Methodist minister, and he's in charge of the largest faith-based, privately funded healthcare center in the United States. And um, Dr. Morris, thank you so much for uh, joining in on the call today. Larry, I'm glad to be with you today. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. So let's start with uh, where you began. Uh, Where did you start? How is it that you ended up becoming uh, both a minister and a family physician? Well, I grew up in Atlanta. Um, I was always interested in the church, but for me, the thought of preaching 52 sermons a year sent shivers down my spine, still does. Um, But I read the Bible, and I realized that a a third of the Bible has to do with healing the sick. It's on every page. But I didn't see it happening uh, in my church or other congregations uh, around the country. We had built hospitals that have church names on them. They do good work, but they had almost nothing to do with worshiping congregations. It, It seemed to me that there ought to be more to it than that. So I end up going to college, go to seminary, spend most of my time in a seminary looking at what the church has historically done, come to realize there's a reason these hospitals have church names on them. We just forgot what it was. And then one day I'm in the chaplain's office at the Yale Medical School, and I look on his desk, and there's a little pamphlet that says, How to Start a Church-Based Health Clinic. And I go, that's it. That's what I want to do. So that, that led me to finish seminary, go to medical school, do my residency, and I was ready to start my own church-based health health clinic. And you ended up in, uh, uh, by the way, where did you go to medical school and residency? So, um, started at Yale, went, finished at Emory, and then my residency at MCV, Medical College of Virginia. Great. And, And how did you end up in Memphis, Tennessee? Um, so after I had uh, uh, finished my education or were uh, getting close to it, um, trying to figure out where was I going to start my own church-based health clinic, I wanted to stay in the South. I did not want to go back to Atlanta because it had just gotten to be too big. And then, not making this up, I read somewhere that Memphis was the poorest major city in America. And based on that, I said, I'm going to Memphis. At that point, I was 33 years old. I was too young, too dumb to realize that what I wanted to do had no chance to succeed. So I literally just came to Memphis completely selling out of an empty cart, knocking on doors, um, trying to engage people to help get the uh, plan off the uh, deck. And um, I think a reflection of who we are is that to start something that was going to be called the Church Health Center, we, we um, had a, have a cross in our logo. It's going to be led by a Methodist minister. I went to the most obvious place for funding, which was a Jewish family foundation, Um, which I I tell you that because it's reflective of who we are. Um, In the New Testament, Paul says we see through a glass darkly, which I think could not be more true. Um, None of us have all the answers. We we need each other. That diversity in all its forms is a good thing. And uh, we have tried to live into that for the last 33 years. That's wonderful. And I'm going to ask you to comment uh, sort of explicitly. In our first conversation um, prior to this one, uh, you clarified what kind of a, a, a Christian you were. And um, I think it's important that I think there are many people who are um, very actively evangelical, and there's many others who are very turned off by the aggressiveness of the evangelical community. Uh, where do you stand in relationship to that? Yeah, so I'm a, a, a mainline Protestant. Um, I'm, uh, a, a, you know, I just, you know, we do the work that we do here at Church Health because of our faith. We do not do it to impose our faith. Um, and so, for that reason, with, within our staff, and we have almost 300 employees. I mean, we're all over the board. Um, you, you don't have to. There's no. Uh, statement of faith you sign. We have Muslims, uh, Hindus uh, working with us. 
you know, again, this idea of, of diversity, um, not just racially, but in, in my opinion, um, theologically, uh, makes us all stronger. Um, you know, I have my opinion of, on Sunday morning, but but during the week, um, we're, we're here rolling up our sleeves to, to do this together. Um, you know, our focus is on providing health care for people who work in low-wage jobs who don't have health insurance. Um, you know, we, we take care of the people who work to make our lives comfortable. That That's our niche. Um, and every world religion I know uh, is called to do that same thing. And, you know, for us, this is all hands on deck. And uh, you want to work with us, then let's roll up our sleeves and do it together. So I have to tell the listeners, um, our daughter, my daughter, lives in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, when we visit, uh, I would often go for a run and ended up going by. Uh, there's a very nice uh, rails to trails track that uh, runs from a nice area of Memphis into a poor area of Memphis. And I would go by this uh, Sears distribution center, which is a humongous building. And many years ago, when we first started going down there, I would see it. It was a total eyesore, broken windows, fences around it. It was a symbol of urban decay in the first order. And it was not too long ago that I learned that the place had been rehabbed and, and new life brought to it. And I later then learned that Dr. Morris uh, had a direct hand in, in all of that happening. So can you can you tell us how that happened? Sure. So um, Church Health began in 1987 in a, a small house uh, in Midtown Memphis. Um, it had you know, literally, literally just had been the home of a prominent Memphian and at his death became a boarding house, was a brothel at one point. Um, so 1987, it was just me. I was the only doctor. But uh, over time, uh, we had grown into 13 buildings. Uh, we were taking care of 70,000 people. Um, it had become very inefficient. And then um, some friends who uh, were artists uh, came to me with the idea of renovating what had once been a Sears distribution center uh, that was built in 1987. Uh, but it had been abandoned in 1992. Uh, as you mentioned, um, it was in a terrible situation. Uh, there were, th this building's the same size and square footage as the Empire State Building. Um, every last window had been broken out. Um, it had gotten to be, why would gangs write graffiti on it? What more was there to say? Um, they wanted to turn it into an artist colony and wanted us to be their doctors. That's all they were asking for. I think everybody listening would agree that that is a financially viable idea. No, that is something that has no <laughs> chance to succeed. But um, right. what I said to them in, in 2011, 2011 was that, well, what if we move in there with you? So, so I married one crazy idea with another crazy idea. And, um, and then over the next three and a half years, uh, we worked together. And I can just tell you, it is amazing what, Three hundred million dollars can do to an abandoned building. Uh, so we, we moved in here in uh, uh, March of 2017, and uh, it's just been an example of what's possible in God's imagination. So that n number rings a bell. Three hundred million. Where where did that come from, and how did that come? Yeah, so that that is what it took to uh, renovate this building. That. Um, in the 1920s, Sears built 10 distribution centers around the country. Uh, when you think about it, Sears was Amazon before somebody thought of Amazon. You know, somewhere along the way, Sears missed the memo. Um, and as a result of their failed business practices, uh, these 10 buildings, which had the same architect, um, were all abandoned. Uh, two were torn down. We are now the sixth to be fully restored. Uh, Seattle, Minneapolis, Boston, Dallas, Atlanta. To give you a sense of scale, the building in Atlanta is 2 million square feet in size. It is the largest brick building in the world. Um, the building in Seattle um, is the home office of Starbucks. It is a million square feet of coffee. Um, and our building's right in the middle, 1.5 million square feet. Um, but to do the renovation, um, that, that's what it was going to cost. Um, 
So th there are 30 financial institutions involved. Uh, it is the most complicated real estate deal in the history of Memphis. It includes new market tax credits, historic tax credits. I don't know what those things were before, but now I really like them, effectively free money. Uh, $15 million from our city, $5 million from our county. And then, there, look, there's a lot of philanthropy involved or it couldn't uh, be possible, but it is possible. And we, we've been here now for two and a half years. And, and you were in the middle of raising all that money? I, I am a professional beggar. Um, so I spend uh, <laughs> half my time playing doctor, half my time being an administrator, and, and uh, more than two-thirds of my time raising money. So, so I have so, to tell so, you, so, yeah. well, I was going to say, the last time I was in Memphis, just a few months ago, uh, and my daughter said, oh, Dad, you need to go take a look. The place is being totally rehabilitated. So I went in there, and I gave myself a, a tour of the first three floors and was really impressed. And then as I came out the side door, I saw a pool being built, which uh, I later learned is a pool for the local community, which is a, a community that's uh, very much uh, in underserved. Um, right. So this, this resource that you're developing for both health, spirituality, uh, physical health, um, I think reflects the, the the core philosophy that you have about the the, the nature of health. Could you say more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so that pool is is a church health pool. It's um, there'll be others in the you know work in the building and our staff who can use it, but it's primarily there to teach inner city kids how to swim. Um, that that's why we you know, invested two million dollars to build a pool. But um, to, to the point you were just making, um, to really understand church health and and Cross town and what we're trying to do, um, you have to view our understanding of health, which is, you know, being healthy is not about the absence of disease. The World Health Organization would agree with that. Who cares if you live two years longer if it means two years longer in a nursing home? You know, life for life's sake can't possibly be the point. So what we've come to believe is that health and healthcare should be about helping people achieve what we're convinced are the goals for living. So, so these goals are true for all of us, you know, whether you're a provider, whether you're a patient, for, for everybody who's listening. Um, and those are three. Number one, having more joy in your life. Number two, having more love in your life. And number three, be driven closer to those things greater than we are. Now, we would generally call that God. You don't have to call that God. Um, but this is what it takes in order to live a healthy life, more joy, more love, and to be driven closer to God. But if that's the goals for living, it doesn't have a lot to do with the doctor. So as we um, go about practicing and, and doing the work of family doctors, and we now have a family medicine residency as well, um, we're training young doctors and we're caring people with those goals in mind. Um, and, th and that really drives all of our programming, which is about far more than just the doctor. So you told me that um, one of the things that you offer is a gap year experience. Could you talk about that? Yeah, and I, I would love for everybody listening to the to think long and hard about doing uh, similar things if, if part of our goal here is to raise up family doctors who um, are not going to just believe in Dr. God. So, um, yes, for almost 30 years now, we, we've had a program where you uh, finish college, you want to go to medical school, uh, you come work for us for a year, uh, the kids get uh, unbelievably good clinical experience, um, but they work fully embedded uh, with everything that we do here at Church Health and, and at Crosstown, which includes um, our culinary medicine programs, we run a school, our programs around um, movement, uh, they are uh, in, in embedded with our physicians, but also embedded with um, our counselors, uh, our programs around behavioral health, uh, substance abuse, um, it's a year-long program, 
Now, we only pay them $10 a year, uh, $10 a year, $10 an hour, um, but we call them church health scholars. You know, what, what we've learned about kids at this age is that what they're really good at doing is studying, but what they're not so good at doing is working. Um, so it's not just work. There's also an academic component to this. But, but what we're trying to do is raise up our own doctors down the road. Um, so, so we currently have over 1,000 kids who've done our scholar program who've gone on to medical school. And one of my most favorite times is right now in July where I will get phone calls from people who did our scholar program 10 years ago, and they call me and say, uh, you won't believe this, but I'm a real doctor now. And the experience of church health formed my view of the type of doctor I want to be. Um, we need to be doing more programs like this across the country. That has to be incredibly satisfying. It makes me smile in ways you wouldn't believe. I believe you. So you yeah. told me that um, you today you have a, a group of people who are in from across the country that you're working with. Could you say something about that uh, uh, Empowering Church Health Opportunities program? So, so literally uh, 30 years ago, um, the, the first group um, of people in another community, you know, came and, and wanted us to help them figure out how they could do similar in their own community. That, that first group actually was in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, but it became more than we could handle just uh, taking people um, one at a time. So, so we developed um, – our, what we call our replication seminar, and then a few years ago, uh, with the financial support of um, a very generous man in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, created something called ECHO. It stands for Empowering Church Health Opportunity. And the point of ECHO is to, to work with communities across the country um, to try to create a clinic similar to ours, but based on our model. You know, our model is not as an FQHC, um, our model's about engaging the broader faith community to do what we believe God's called us to do. And you know, I don't know a single faith community in America that's funded by the federal government. So for that reason, we, we don't pursue federal funding. I mean, it does mean – I mean, here in Memphis, we have to raise $20 million a year. But um, we are out there trying to uh, help people get started. And it begins with a, a two-day seminar in Memphis. Um, but literally today as we speak, we have people from 10 different cities here. Um, they're from really several cities in, um, in Texas, from New York, from Atlanta, from North Carolina. Um, and you know, I'm not sure how many of them will actually follow through and get it done, but um, there are more than 30 clinics out there that are up and running that that began this way. There are 29 we are currently working with, and I personally think um, all the chaos in Washington uh, around healthcare, an unintended consequence, has opened the door to create clinics like this all over the country. So, Scott, I'm wondering if you could comment on this. There are some people, the single payer people, for example, who have a strong aversion or concern, I should say, about independent groups like yours developing networks like you're developing, because they want everything under one um, federal um, uh, plan so that everyone gets access to everything that they should have access to. And yet you're taking the approach that, um, that uh, people of faith can uh, support and build communities that uh, promote a broad range uh, of health. Could you comment on that? Yes. And th do I think everybody should have health care? Absolutely. Um, I'm now old enough to have lived through this in more iterations than you can imagine. Um, and part of what troubles me greatly about it's either universal health care or nothing is that right now we have nothing 
Um, and so what, what are poor people supposed to do? Um, and, and people of good hearts, are we just supposed to be out there advocating for universal health care and in the meantime uh, hope and pray poor people get better um, because, for our good intentions? Um, you know, I think everybody realizes we have a divided country right now, and you know, just you know, my, my first generations of going to Washington back when the Clintons were in power and we were going to have universal health care then, well, uh, that didn't happen. And then I lived through the Affordable Care Act, and, and look where that is today. Um, I am not holding my breath for the next iteration to happen. If it happens, fantastic. But even in countries that, quote, unquote, have universal health care, they don't have universal health care. Um, Great Britain has got huge gaps around people who are uninsured. And in this country, even with the most progressive people out there, if you're an immigrant in this country, uh, you don't count. Um, my friend Jim Wallace wrote a book a few years ago called God's Politics, how the right doesn't get it and the left doesn't care. It could not be more true. Uh, the so, so, all of which is to say, you know, the work that we do, we are not here trying to solve the great social problems in America. We do not know how to do that. The only thing we're trying to do is ask the question, what is the faith community's role in all of this? You know, my, my liberal friends, that, that question is never asked. You know, my, most of my liberal friends consider the church to be um, on the other side. And from my church perspective, many of my church friends are on the other side. Um, but that doesn't speak for everybody. You, know, you asked me that question about, you know, what type of Christian I am. I mean, I'm a Christian who believes in following Jesus and not necessarily have a right doctrine about Jesus. And, and following Jesus to me means you care for the poor, uh, you're engaged in a healing ministry, and you're not doing it tomorrow, you're doing it today. So I would imagine that your uh, your approach has gotten a lot of uh, uh, visibility uh, in Memphis and elsewhere, obviously. Um, what's your, your sense? You, you, you have 30... Uh, models that are ongoing and another 29 possibly in the works. Well, what's your sense of, of the potential of this, uh, this approach across the U.S.? So, look, we, we do not even propose that our model can solve the issues of health care for the uninsured. We don't claim that. We're not, we don't believe that. Um, but what I do know is that if you just look at free and charitable clinics across the United States, free and charitable clinics actually care for more people than the FQHCs in, in terms of the raw numbers. Um, so it is an asset that we don't ever seem to understand. Um, mm. you know, I, I personally believe this is all driven by theological concepts, um, and, and I begin with Descartes. Um, Descartes convinces us in the, uh, as a 16th century uh, French philosopher that you can take a human being and separate us into a body and a spirit. Um, now this is all just a recapitulation of Plato. But what we have done is we put the body on one side and say it's the purview of science and medicine. We put the spirit on the other, say it's okay for people of faith to mess around with your spirit, but these two things should never intersect. Well, on both sides, both medicine and the faith community, we have 100% bought into this dualistic way of seeing the world and seeing human beings, and it is fundamentally flawed. Um, and as a result, I think it's the number one driver around how our healthcare system is broken, um, and it's also a reflection of ways that in today's world, the church is broken too. Um, but I do, we actually believe that health is a way to actually – uh, improve both uh, the church and uh, health care if we could find a way to realize that we are ultimately dust and breath. You know, um, we are both body and spirit, and those two things can't be separated. 
I I can't agree with you more. Um, wh- where do you see what do you see in the future? Wh- where's where are things going for you? Well, I mean, we're just going to keep doing what we do. <laughs> you know, I, you said are we well known? The fact is, we're in Memphis, and so we're not well known because we're not on the East Coast or the West Coast, and um, and nobody pays attention to the middle of the country. Um, you know what? What I believe is that uh, you know our marching orders are are coming from a, a deep uh, biblical understanding of what God has called us to do. But I also think the same would be true if you're uh, Muslim or Jewish or Hindu, for that matter. I mean, those four world religions are lockstep together about the issues that we're talking about. Um, but the but we live in a world where they're not supposed to care about the body, um, and and yet an example of how that is so flawed is in, in medicine every day people go to the emergency room with chest pain. We stick tubes all in them. Um, their arteries may be clear, and we tell them there's nothing wrong with them, and that will continue to be the case because there is no – technological advance that can diagnose a broken heart. Um, And we treat broken hearts every day with pills and are shocked that it doesn't work. Um, So so where we would, we're trying to go, um, you know, I do believe that family doctors um, are our best chance to be able to bridge this gap. Um, So within our own residency, trying to train young doctors who see this link between faith and health, um, and go out and and recruit more to in, into this path. Um, if we can't get this right, then we're going to continue to perpetuate a broken system. And um, you know, on the other side of the ledger with the church, I mean, I'll just give you one example of that. That the least healthy meal you can eat every week is at a church. You know, our churches have blessed the sin of gluttony for the sake of fellowship. You know, that can't possibly be right. In the midst of the obesity epidemic in America, clergy are 20 percent heavier than the rest of the population. You know, you can't have a healthy church; well, you don't have healthy leaders. So, um, you know, so part of our mission is to just try to help on both sides to say uh, we can do this better. Um, and, and we're trying to use the church health example and others around the country as models to show how to do it. God, I have to tell you. This is our second conversation, and uh, if I, I have anything to do it, with it, it won't be our last. What you're <laughs> doing and have done is truly remarkable. Um, people are talking about, uh, in medicine, are talking about the social determinants of health, and how do you, how does a family physician uh, address those? And I think you are a an incredible model uh, for people to study. And, uh, and and there are some other centers around, not, not only in your network, but other centers. Some are non-denominational. Some are uh, where family docs in particular are figuring out how to uh, address uh, the broader issues. And I, I love your uh, talking about uh, joy, love, and closer to something greater than yourself, whether you call that God or whatever, as being the... Uh, 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 are the goals for what we're trying to do. So I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to talk with us today. And uh, I wanted to ask, is it okay with you if I put your name and email address uh, along with the announcement of this podcast when it comes out so that people can reach out to you if they'd like to learn more? Yeah, absolutely. And, and our website is just churchhealth.org. Um you know, along right. with what we do here, we actually publish a lot of stuff um, that all of that's available on our website. So Fantastic. the answer is yes. I would, I would more than okay. more than happy for you to put it on. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for talking with me today. Thank you, Larry. Enjoyed it.